Do you like the north of England? Would you like to spend a couple of days doing nothing but playing board games, eating great food, in the presence of fantastic people, some well-known faces from board game media, and potentially Matthew Jude smelling great? Then, come to Aircon between the 13th to 15th of March next year. Tickets and more information are available on their website. That's aircon.co.uk and also in the links in the show notes. And now, on with the show! Welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for October. Now, could be spooky, could be autumny. There's a lot of themes. Halloween. Now, there's a film for you. There's a lot of themes, a lot of films going about that have themes to do with spooky stuff. And uh, sometimes you just want to talk about these films. And if you're going to be talking about these films... You really want to get yourself a little bit of an expert. Maybe somebody who, oh, I don't know, knows an awful lot about films, involves himself in the media, maybe has gone as far as maybe, I don't know, writing a quiz book about such things. So it's a little bit of a break away from the norm. But uh, I mean, I'm not here to talk about somebody who's young geek. It's maybe somebody who's maybe a little bit vintage geek. Because joining me on the show, I've got Marshall Julius. So hello, Marshall. Well, hello. I suppose I am a vintage geek. It's true. I turned 50 this year, so I suppose that does make me something of a vintage character. <laughs> How you doing? Are you well? Are you, are you, are you just back? You're so tired. Are you just, are you being, are you being on journeys, Mr. Julius? I have. I just got back, um, from, um, New York Comic Con, uh, which was, uh, four days of just absolute mad intense, um, wonderful craziness i really really enjoyed it so it was it was just wonderful but it's like uh it's incredibly tiring i i was staying in a hotel like a like yeah. a mile and a half away from the javits center which is this enormous place where you know they basically fill it stuffed full of, of nerds uh, like myself and uh and nerds unlike myself, cosplay nerds and stuff. Yeah. But, you know, I, I love it. It's amazing. But uh, I was sent over by um, this wonderful toy company um, called Far Out Toys, Inc. And they have uh, produced this fantastic toy line called uh, Pulp Heroes. They're these kind mm. of collapsible cardboard Marvel and Star Wars um, characters. And uh, they, they, they fold flat in, in t- and they go into these kind of vintage comic book sleeves and then you pull them out and they pop out into full 3D and they have wheels and I mean they're, they're just really fun and they look cool they're good for toy photographers and they're good to play with they're good for collectors and so I was very excited to unveil the new Star Wars range oh, and cool. so they, they sent me um they, uh, so they, they sent me, uh, to, to New York and they said there's going to be, you know, we'll send the toys to your hotel and, you know, every day. I said, I'll go down and I'll, I'll hand some out. I'll tell people about it. I'll tell them about our social media. I'll, I'll schmooze with people. And they said, that sounds amazing. And we've had, you know, 200 sent to you. And, um, <laughs> but the ones from China, the, the Star Wars ones, we sent you the Marvel ones, but the Star yeah. Wars ones are coming from, uh, from China. And right. every single one of those was sent in a separate palette. And so, so every single toy was wrapped in this very hard cardboard case and the, wow. and six of those to every box. So, basically when i turned up to the hotel i had 30 boxes of stuff to go through <laughs> and uh, they'd sent me like a like an ex- a, a, one of those you know sharp knives the exacto knives or whatever yeah, they yeah, call yeah. it the box cutters in america mm-hmm. and uh, i basically you know having traveled for like 18 hours or something uh, i'm in my very small hotel room um trying to move around and i just cre- I just created this mad i could have created the craziest box for ever um but you know it was fine i got them all out i got them separated every day i would go with this massive backpack to comic con and i would hand out toys to people yeah. who and I, you know i really loved doing that you know it was like i have the sort of 
Santa body type. So um, I didn't have that. I did. I should have cosplayed, but you should know, have. I should have cosplayed. You might have been arrested though if you were going about <gasps> handing out kind of like toys to folk dressed as a Santa. Though you know what? That might have been a possibility. I wasn't trying to lure them into a van or anything. I, I was just. I was out in plain sight. Um, and, and honestly, I, I really loved doing it. It was really yeah. fun because um, people were excited to see them. They're really cool looking toys. You can get them on Amazon now, yeah. but when I was giving them out they were like brand new and i started giving them out like a day before they were even um, wow. released so they, it was pretty exciting um to you know see people's reaction and of course you know i'm like uh, oh yeah would you like this toy it's free and then as soon as they took it i said oh can i have a picture with you so it's like see there's no such thing as free not really but i was giving them uh, i was you know giving them to cosplayers yeah. And, um, you know, it's fantastic. You know, you find a Darth Vader cosplay, you give him a Darth Vader toy. I mean, you know, it's like that picture just creates itself. So I had a lot of fun doing that. And uh, while I was at Comic Con, I was also, like you mentioned, I was promoting my book as well. Yeah, because you've been, I mean, you've been involved in, I guess, the kind of the geek uh, world for a long time. I mean, growing up. It was, you know, you were, you were, was that when you kind of started really kind of getting the itch for everything kind of like Star Wars y and, and sci fi and stuff like that? Was that what happened when you were kind of a, a relatively, when you were a younger kind of Marshall? Well, younger Marshall's actually interested in a lot, but most of the same things that older Marshall's interested in. I mean, I, I was just, um, like everybody else, um, like everybody else my age or most everybody else my age yeah. in the 70s when star wars came out i was nine years old and it, it blew my mind and it, it changed my life forever i mean you know it's easy these days um to you know you, you get one event film after another and you just don't really appreciate the specialness of any of it i think maybe people feel that way about marvel films but even marvel films you know you've got two three a year um you know this was like when star wars came around there was nothing there was nothing like it you know there'd nothing been like that before not really it, it just changed the game and it, it just uh, set me on this crazy course um i mean i was always into geeky things before yeah. um my cousin uh ronald um who goes by ron now and is a producer he produced the twilight zone play um in the west oh. end recently um he uh he's a few years older than me i used to go to his house he was a collector he kind of um you know, turn me on to collecting, really. My mum was a nerd before the term even existed. We used to, uh, I grew up watching films with her and she showed me every kind of thing and she would always tell me about them. She would tell me, you know, about the actors and, and to a lesser extent, but the directors, all these great behind the scenes stories. And she had such incredible enthusiasm for it that, uh, I was just primed to be a nerd, um, uh, through both of their influences and through just my natural, you know, being, of meanness. <laughs> were, you inter um, that's were you interested in what was behind the scenes then? I mean, it sounds to me oh, like yeah. it wasn't just a case that you were the guy that would, you'd watch Star Wars and then you would join the queue again. It sounds to me like you got to the point where you were kind of a bit, well, this is fine, but actually I'd be interested to know how this kind of works a little bit more behind the scenes. And it wasn't just the films themselves. It was also maybe the things that surrounded the films, you know, as in how maybe oh, how they got sure. made, who were the people oh, behind absolutely. it and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, once you realize, um, that, um, if you like, if you like North by Northwest, say it's like, and you find out as a kid that that was, uh, a kind of signature film from uh, this man called the director, who's the one that mm. is, you know, most responsible for the artistic direction of a film. And then you think, okay, so what? So I really like that. And uh, it turns out he made loads of other films. And it's like, well, if I like one, maybe I like the other. And then, you know, and then you watch a bunch of other Hitchcock films and you think, oh my God, I've really stumbled onto something. You know, it's like, uh, so what other film directors do I like? And then, and then you think, well, you know, kind of what genres do I like? And, and, you know, I mean, you're not necessarily thinking that way consciously, but, um, once you start to see kind of patterns and uh, and you 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 realize what it is that you like then you seek out more of it and um i was i was interested in in you know who was responsible for the things that i loved and um to a, to a lesser extent how they made it i mean behind the scenes stuff is fun but i'm not super technical so mm. um 
you know, I wasn't particularly interested in the, in the nitty gritty of it, but um, I enjoyed, you know, as I was getting older, horror movie makeups, and um, I, I, I liked kind of the stories that you hear, the, the crazy things that go on, and the big characters that are involved, and uh, and my mum would tell me a lot of those things. So I it just, I was, you know, I was just interested. I loved the the films and the shows. I wanted to know about the people who made them. I wanted to see what else they did, and you know, in the seventies and the eighties. Um, you know, nowadays everybody's spoiled. You've got, you know, everything you can find on the internet. Everything has got like uh, hours of special features. But that wasn't the case, you know, when I was growing up. Um, if you wanted to see behind the scenes stuff, they sometimes had these very late documentaries, always as fillers at different times. And, yeah. uh, you know, or you had to, you had to go, um, up to town or comic book conventions, which are also quite thin on the ground and, and read, um, Starlog and, you know, those sorts of magazines. And, you know, it just, it was, it was a little bit harder but I didn't mind that you know because it felt like if you you earn the knowledge you know you earn the knowledge and the geekery um, that you walked away with and so um it t- also turned out that I had a kind of a decent capacity for, for remembering all of that stuff, you know, not about real world stuff. I never did yeah. very well in school because I was never really interested in the sorts of things they taught me at school. Yeah. Um, I liked to write and I was interested in, in films and, you know, those two things just kind of led me to where I, I am and the path I'm still on, I suppose. It's because you've got what can only be described as a, as a, as a, a, f- a hugely respectable collection in terms of memorabilia and, you know, just stuff that your average kind of person would walk in and go, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> and it's like, you know, was that, was that something you started off from an early age as well? Because I know a lot, because I know there's, a, oh, there's probably sure. there's a ton of Star Wars fans out there who are still will wake up crying at four o'clock in the middle of the night going, I can't believe I chucked out my, I can't believe I chucked out my X-Wing kind of thing, you know, and there are obviously other people who manage to hold on to it. It goes into an attic, it goes into a box and then they go away to university or, you know, or they're just, you know, they, they're, they're cleaning out, you know, a lot of the time from the stories I hear, it's like, were they cleaning out the house when, you know, one of their parents kind of passes away and they're just trying to get and they open the box and they go, oh, look, there's all my Star Wars stuff. There's my, um, you know, there's my ba- Battle for the Planets kind of books and stuff like that. I mean, what, did you, did you manage to hold on to the stuff that you had, your toys and stuff? Or is that something that you kind of have retroactive? kind of collected over the time as oh, time no. goes on. No, no, not at all. My sevens arc sevens, my C three POs, my Twinkies, yeah. I, I bought them and um I collected them as as they were coming out. Um, yeah. and, and to some extent I bought some older stuff as I would seek it out at conventions, yeah. you know, but um I had I I never put my stuff away in boxes my stuff was never stuck in the loft um there was never a time when i i disappeared from the house for a few years and you know you hear a lot of stories about when people do go to uni (laughs) and their parents have a clear out and they get rid of all their stuff i hear that a lot especially from people who come and look at my collection and then they say you know i had that Chewbacca, I had, you know, that Millennium Falcon, but, you know, my parents got rid of it. And, you know, I, I, that sort of parenting I regard as abusive, you know. <laughs> I think it's completely unforgivable. Oh my God. You know, and my mum, there was no way that she would have put her hands on, on my stuff. You know, I, I, I was a bit, of, I suppose I was always, I never really wanted to throw anything away. I, from when I was small, I kind of saw the value in, odd things i suppose i remember my dad died when i was small when i was about nine years old i remember going with him to the off license um to get a crate of cokes of mm. you know coca-cola that, that came in that classic bottle back then and gosh i sound really old um and at the time there were some kids at school who were wearing these like necklaces with tiny coke bottles on them as as the, and uh, I, I thought that was cool there was just something about the coke design that i thought was just um i mean i wouldn't have used the word iconic then yeah, yeah. but there was just uh, there was just i kind of uh, there was something that i saw in it some sort of value some some sort of kind of aesthetic that i really appreciated and so we went uh, to the off license and um, my dad got a crate of cokes and I, I said to him um 
can I have a bottle, please? Um, and he said, what, what, are you thirsty? I said, no, no, can I just have a bottle as an ornament in my bedroom? Yeah. And, you know, he looked at me for a second. He said, yeah, yeah, absolutely, you know, if that's what you want. And, you yeah. know, I've still got that Coke bottle. Wow. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it right now. You know, I, I, uh, I still got that Coke bottle and I've still got everything else um, throughout my life that I had that same sort of feeling about. And I had that same sort of feeling about lots of things. You know, I, I sometimes uh, I see these things and it's like, oh my God, that's amazing. I must have it. It happened at Comic-Con, um, you know, two days ago. And it's happened every day since I was, or every other day since I was small. And all I've done is over the years, just amassed this big collection this a huge collection of, of stuff that i couldn't walk away from you know if i see a, a badge or or an action figure or a comic book or a set of trading cards or you know and i just think that well there's just something about that that really appeals to me then you know screw it get it do you um do you collect things because they're collectible or because there's t there's two sides i see there's two sides to a collector and you get them in the board game side of things. You get people that will buy a certain board game because they know if they hang on to it, it's going to be worth some money. And it's the same with the Star Wars memorabilia. People are all going on about, well, if you have this Obi-Wan Kenobi that was produced in this batch, he's got a slightly different coloured skin tone, which means he's worth an extra gazillion pounds kind of thing. But do you do you ever... I mean, obviously, some of the stuff that you'll have will be valuable, valuable. But it oh, sounds sure. to me that you're the type of person that you you kind of value your collection based on the memories that it's kind of given you. Like the Coke bottle is a really good example. But is there oh, other things sure. you look around and go, "I remember when I got that. I've got a good idea of when I kind of got that." And yeah, so, you, yeah. are you a collector of almost memory joggers, as opposed to a collector of saying, "Well, you know, once I." pop my clogs, you know, this can be all sold and they can make a small fortune with it. Absolutely. I, I think, honestly, if you want to, um, if you want to collect as some sort of investment, mm -hmm. then I don't, I, I think that there's better things to invest your money in. I think there are more, there are smarter, safer things um, to invest your money in than um, memorabilia. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I only, only ever collect stuff that, uh, that I just really want. It just, you know, the, the few times in my life when I thought, okay, I don't really have a feeling for that, but I have access to this and I'm pretty sure that it's going to be worth something one day. The few times in my life where I cynically tried to get something just so that I could turn it around one day, um, it actually turned out to be uh, not that valuable. There were these uh, Star Wars customizable card game cards and, uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I tried, I, I collected a whole bunch of those, but then so did millions of other people. And um, it's just, you know, to this day, they have almost no value and um it, so it, it taught me a lesson um and you just uh you get what you love and um, if it turns out to be valuable then great and if it doesn't well that shouldn't be why you bought it in the first place you know mm -hmm. I, I i i think that you know when i was small um th th that whole kind of um built-in collectability wasn't a thing you, you didn't have um toy companies um you know screwing with a, a hundred of a figure so saying you know with a slight difference to make it a chase figure or yeah. you know yeah. you didn't have trading card companies create um you know 300 extra cards signature cards and 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 and, and, and shiny cards and fold out you know blueprint cards and, and and you know and just every every possible kind of technology just so that they could uh, have all these chase cards that even if you bought a whole box you wouldn't get a whole set you'd have to you know you get a base set or two base sets and maybe two or three of the specials but then you'd have to what go online and hunt them down and hunting down things is is kind of fun to some extent but at some point you realize that um you're never actually going to get everything you just you just can't because even if you try and get every single card in a set of something, there's going to be some convention exclusive on the other side of the world that they only had fifty of, and yeah. you know you're never going to get hold of that. And so, um, although I kind of have the spirit of a completist, I realised a while ago that actually it's a it's a uh, it's an illusion. Um, so I just get 
things that I want. I don't worry about collecting whole sets of things anymore. I mean, yes, I've got whole runs of comic books. I've got complete sets of trading cards to the best of my, you know, ability. And, but, you know, it's expensive and it's like, what are you going to do? You're going to collect all these cards and put them away and never look at them again. And and yeah, I mean, I do have a lot of cards like that because the hunt is, is kind of very satisfying, but, but now it's just, I am quite, it, it's quite cynical, uh, the business. And, you know, coming back from Comic-Con, um, where, you know, you have to enter a lottery to be, a, to be given the opportunity to shop in the Funko store, you know, and then when you do, you spend a thousand dollars on, you know, 50, a hundred figures, and then you go immediately to eBay. And you sell them for three, four times what you paid for them. And it was like, yeah. this is Funko is, Funko is, um, encouraging that sort of madness. There were people who had won the lottery for the opportunity to queue for two hours to buy Funko, inflated price Funko things because it's a slightly different color scheme or, you know, they've created this great toy that everybody would like. But, you know, instead of making enough of it so that everyone can have one, they've only made 300 of them. And numbered them, and you know they just create this kind of fake scarcity. And uh, there, there were people who came out of the Funko store, and they were just uh, they were selling them like you know fifty meters away around the corner for three times what they just bought for them, and people were paying for buying them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sad. I mean, it's it's kind of sad because I remember just. It was always stuff was all available. I remember kind of like the World Cup sticker albums. Yeah, and you can still uh, you, know, we, you could still contact Panini and ask them to give you the the stickers that you didn't have. You would send them money. You would send them like a, and here this is where we both show that we're old. A postal order. Um, you'd go down to the post office and you'd give them money. They would give you a postal order. You'd send it off to Panini, and it was something like four pence or five pence a sticker and it's something like 10 pence for a shiny one and you'd be able to kind of complete your set Um, because I remember the you know the Star Wars one Return of the Jedi I think Return of the Jedi was I think was when it really kind of went beyond the kind of the the normal merchandising and when it started to get maybe a little bit silly I remember Return of the Jedi yogurts (laughs) Um, I remember Return of the Jedi. I just all different kind of strange kind of um, bits of memorability. I remember, I do remember the Return of the Jedi sticker album, and you could actually mm. get, you could actually kind of go and get the stickers that you didn't have. And 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 funnily enough, I think they had they had pictures in the sticker album which weren't part of the actual film. <laughs> I think they'd taken a couple of frames. That didn't kind of exist, which was kind of, which was kind of, kind of interesting. Um, oh yeah, oh, I love those. I love those Panini things. And yes, look here. Here was it. It was just one basic set of stickers. Yeah. And yeah. they, uh, and, and if you were five or six short that you couldn't get, and I think that they, they kind of discouraged you to order like you know dozens and dozens. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, up to like a pound or something. Um, I seem to remember when I was very young, actually uh, sellotaping a few coins to a postcard and putting it in an envelope and sending that um, and uh, and getting a few stickers from Panini. But nowadays um, you would have to, you'd ha- you know, you'd have to buy hundreds of packets of something in order to complete a collection. And look, you know, it's like if people want to do that, I don't want to say that uh, collecting now is, is, is no good, but it's definitely, um, it's, it's a more avaricious business than it used to be. And There's it used a- to be that toys were produced for kids, you know, yeah. and that, you know, us man children, um, <laughs> And woman <laughs> children that, that we just saw some appeal in it, and we wanted to collect them, and just the world caught up with us, basically. Um, yeah. So things yeah. became collectible by accident, not by design. And I exactly. think when you try and make something by design, it does take a little bit of the specialness away from you. Like, I like good bad movies, but the best bad movies were made by filmmakers who wanted to make a good movie, but they were just terrible. And uh, they ended up making a terrible film like Edward, you know, his films. He was trying, he wasn't trying to make a bad film. So you can't, I don't think you can consciously make your great collectible. Not really. I think, uh, 
you get the filmmakers now who try and make these parody bad films and um, yeah. they just don't they just don't work for me in the same way that an accidentally bad film does and so for me collectibles that were created um just for fans and kids um uh, uh, the films when they came out uh, uh, have more value and meaning to me than say the latest trading card collection that you are absolutely almost physically impossible you know you have no chance of, of collecting properly is there a is there a holy grail i mean is that what i'm trying to say is is there an indiana jones raiders of the lost ark idol that you would risk jumping across a pit avoiding a rolling boulder in order to run in kind of avoid all the pressure pads and stand and exchange like a bag of sand and there was a collectible on the pedestal what would that collectible be that you'd be willing to take that risk that's a really good question um i think that uh I think that what I want more than anything is just more room for my existing, uh, for my existing collectibles. What I would like is, uh, what I would like to be on the other end of that gorge is another room that I could just, you know, I could then possess and I could fill up the walls. And, uh, I, I, I you know, I don't have any one particular thing that I would, um, be desperate to have. I mean, there are certain things that would be nice, um, you know, autographs of, um, you know, people who have passed, you know, like a, a Groucho Marx signed picture or a Boris Karloff or, or Doug McClure, you know. Um, but I, I suppose, I so now that I, I'm thinking while I'm answering, and, and there is this one thing that I, I probably would endanger my life to acquire, and it was this, um, I can't remember um, the company that made it offhand because it's been a, a few years since I, uh, I tried to stop thinking about it because it was driving me crazy. It's this uh, fantastic uh, Japanese Robbie the Robot. And uh, it was, you know, it was quite a decent size and beautiful, just really kind of very accurate. And uh, if you popped it open from the head inside, there was a scale model of the guy who actually operated it from the inside during Forbidden Planet. And I thought that's no got to be the just, abs oh yeah, I thought that's got to be the, the, you know, they found out who, who it was. They actually made a, you know, facially it's like spot on. And so you got like a really great Robbie the robot with this fantastic secret inside. And, um, Robbie for me has always been the ultimate movie robot. And, uh, I mean, you know, he's amusing, he's chunky, retro, brilliant, and he's got mad skills. And, uh, I, I think that, that toy, I would really, really like that toy. I think most of the other kind of things that I've chased in my life have actually gotten or yeah. have kind of gone, yeah. well, you know, I can live without that. But I would probably jump across the gorge or I would grab one of my kids and, and hurl them across the gorge and say, go on, grab it because I could probably hurl them more further than I could jump myself. And I'd have a rope attached. So, you know, <laughs> they'd have a better than average chance of surviving. I'm glad you, um, you added that bit in to be perfectly honest. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not a, I'm not a monster. <laughs> um, when did the writing start? I mean, when was it you kind of decided actually I'm going to kind of I'm going to start to write stuff. I'm going to I don't just want to you know enjoy this. I want to almost tell other people that I kind of enjoy this. So mm. I mean, when did when did that kind of kick off for yourself? Well, writing was at school the only thing that I enjoyed. I like kind of creative writing. I like making things up. Um, I I when I yeah, about 18, I finished, uh, you know, I did my A-levels and um, I had to decide about, you know, did I want to go to university? Did I mm -hmm. want to study journalism? Or it seemed like writing was the only thing that I was actually um, good at in terms of um, trying to make a living doing something. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough at 18 to get a job for what's on London magazine. Um, 
which was a you know flea pit of a of a magazine. It was a tourist thing, but uh, it, it gave me tremendous access to um, a world that I couldn't could have only dreamed about before. I was at eighteen. I was going off and interviewing you know movie stars and directors. I was going to screenings and uh, swanky parties, and you know I was leaving li- living that media lifestyle. Um, and you know, I, I was I was really loving it. I just really, really enjoyed it, and I, I came to realize pretty quickly that because um, people, you ask people today, like what well, you ask kids today, what what they think of as an old film, and and um, you know, they won't even say Back to the Future. They're not going to go thirty years back. They'll go ten years back. You know, you ask most kids today if they've ever seen a black and white film, they look at you like you're insane. Um, there's a, there's so much <laughs> yeah. wonderful yeah. you know there's so much wonderful stuff going back a hundred years now um that um could easily easily be forgotten um if not for for nerds basically and i, I think mean you're talking kind of- about your um your charlie chaplin i think i just on the tv the other day there was like they just put a clip of kind of charlie chaplin and he was doing the bit when he was going through the machine mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and uh my son who's he's only six and he was looking at it and going who's that and i was like that's charlie chaplin he's like, oh that's and he kind of watched it and he could see it was funny and he it was like it's obviously the extremely kind of physical comedy that's kind of going mm-hmm. on and he even with the age that he is he realizes it's kind of real that it's not kind of this isn't being done on wires and strings and stuff like that, that mm-hmm. it's all down to timing and skill and stuff and i thought you kind of don't you don't really have that kind of nowadays. You have very frenetic kind of John Wick, very, very well choreographed stuff. But that's usually a lot of set pieces. And I'm thinking you don't really get like your Buster Keatons of this, your Harold Lloyds. and Or maybe you do, maybe I'm just looking at it a different way. But the kind of the magic of just having one single person not doing anything special, but making it very, very special, if you know what I mean. I do. Well, I think that those, um, those actors that you, that you mentioned and people like Harold Lloyd and, and stuff, they were the special effects of the twenties and thirties and forties. You know, they were the, the thing that people, um, kind of went to see. Um, and I do think that there are lots of great films today. I, I don't, I don't necessarily think of the good old days as, you know, it's like the only time when there were, yeah. when there were yeah. great movies and movie stars, but, um, there was um, there's some stuff that's been lost over the years. I also think that you, the sort of stuff that Keaton used to do, frankly, um, no actor could do that today because um, he wouldn't get insured. You know, there's no way that yeah. um, you know, frankly, for a you know, hundred million dollar plus movie, hundred and fifty million dollar plus movie, that when they said, um, you know, all right, Keanu, we want you to stand here and we're going to drop a house on you, that yeah. the insurance is not going to go. Um, no, you're not. No chance. Yeah, you know, so I, I just think that uh, they were quite cavalier back in the day. You know, they they really, um, you know, Buster Keaton uh, especially. I mean, took his life in his hands, jumping from you know without safety nets, without ropes. I mean, just like insane stuff. I think they would do stunts that they just kind of sort of worked out on paper, but never actually tried before. And they would just film it and kind of, you know, he was very good at it. He was a real, like a real life sorrow. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's just a different world. People were more cavalier and uh, more, more daring maybe. Um, but uh, it's, it is, it is a different world now. I, I don't, I think there's anything wrong with computer effects if they're not, uh, if they're just part of the mix. You know, I, I think a good mix of practical effects and and CG effects, um, uh, you know, is fine. But I think it, it ultimately it begins and ends with the performer and, and the, that performer, the people who you watch, and they have to have some sort of, you know, magic. You have to, you have to care about them. They have to be some in some way compelling. Whether it's a Keaton doing physical comedy or if it's somebody like Sam Neill who you just um, who you just enjoy to watch because there's just something about them. There's some charisma about them that you can't yeah, take your eyes yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned, you know, obviously, what's on London. And then did you continue? I mean, is because there's a thing about the media things that say, well, if you're going to go and see all these kind of like, if you're hanging around with cinema people and everything like that, then the money mm. must be with you as well. 
And as I know, being involved in the media, the money just isn't kind of there. So were you, did you stay at kind of what's in London for a period of time? Or was there periods where you had to stop writing and just go into kind of like a, a, a job job? A or real you, job? Yeah. No, I, well, I no, exactly no, I don't mean, mean that. I mean, I'm, I kind of... No, no, I know exactly from... what you mean. Believe me, what's on in London was not like a real job. When I first started in what, like 89, yeah. I was uh, 20... And, um, I was, I, my first salary was £6,000 a year and, uh, I was living at home and, you know, it, honestly, it didn't, it was like just, you know, drinking money as far as I was concerned. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't really bother me. I was just having a good time and, and going to all these press parties and going to screenings and meeting famous people. And, um, you know, I was just really, really enjoying myself and I was learning my craft. I was learning to write the, uh, Michael Darvell, the, uh, the assistant editor of the, of the, uh, of the magazine there. He was the film editor. I eventually took over as the film editor when he became the editor, but, uh, he, he was, um, he was very good, uh, teaching me, um, stuff like, you know, grammar and spelling, things that, uh, yeah. that I actually, cause I really didn't learn very much at school. I could write, I could always write, but, um, he, he taught me a little bit of, um, a little bit of craft and, uh, you know, I'm really uh, grateful to him um, for that. But so, you know, I basically learned my skills by by just doing them, and uh, and I, I think the thing that's always charged my work is is just you know kind of enthusiasm and the, the chattiness of the way that I write. People seem to like it, so I was able to make a a meagre living as a journalist mm-hmm. for for a very long time. I um I, I quit what's on twice. And, and then kept going back. And I, I quit. I quit the second time. I, I wrote uh, my first book um, um, uh, about action movies, and then I went back again because you know I was broke and I needed the job. And then, and then after that, I started um, freelancing uh, for some newspapers, the Sunday Express, and you know mm. I, I was never honestly. I've never really been that great, honestly, at, at making money. Um, I am trying to. I'm trying to rectify that, but I don't know. I've never been very good at making money. I've always been very good at getting people to give me stuff for nothing, though. And so that's kind of like my superpower. It's like uh, I see these toys and uh, I really want them. And I just have unlocked the secret of um, of, of, of <laughs> asking for them nicely and having yeah. the, the right people yeah. send them to me. You know, so it's like uh, I've always been good at blagging. Blagging has been my main thing. You know, free and stuff um, creates the best phrase in the, in the whole universe, really. Um, so, you know, you, you take what you can, but um, it would be, uh, yeah, I think if you, if you work in the media, unless you're exceptionally lucky, um, you're, you're, you're never really going to make a, a fortune. I don't know um, any writers, um, any journalists, um, authors, you know, who, who make a super comfortable living. You know, no, but they, they, no. but they seem to love what they do and they, and they, and they live it. And as long as we can get along to, um, to a press screening of something and, uh, and there's a glass of wine there, then I think, you know, we most of us are, are quite happy. Yeah. I've, I've seen that. It's almost like a case that, um, have you seen kind of coverage change dramatically because of the rise of the internet? And things like oh, your yeah. Metacritics of this world, and things like that, and even kind of Hugely. Rotten Tomatoes and and aggregators, and I've never ever understood how you can how you can put, give a score to a film or a TV show, and then compare and contrast media based on a score. That just that just really kind of you know, and and I see them using it in advertising now. HBO's Chernobyl, and they were saying it was one of the highest rated kind of TV shows of all time. It's like, compared to what? Other nuclear disaster TV shows? <laughs> I mean, is this what? Oh no, you're comparing it to Breaking Bad. Why are you comparing it to Breaking Bad? Can I, that just, I don't get it. It's like, you know, it's kind of like, it's like somebody comparing like, I don't know, let's look at let's look at like the Mona Lisa and then let's look at kind of like the Statue of David. And then let's put them up against each other to see which one is the better. It just, it bakes my noodle just seeing where we are in terms of, and in board games, we're lucky because we don't seem to have gone down the numerical value. Video games are stuffed. 
And it seems like movies seem to be the case that you have this Rotten Tomatoes thing, which is fine. I understand that. But also I don't get it because you end up reducing somebody like you to say, give me, you know, it's like, give me a soundbite on the Joker film. And it's like, well, no, bugger off and read my review because I've I spent two hours writing that bad boy. <laughs> and mm, <laughs> you mm. just want like a quick soundbite to say whether you thought it was good or bad. Um, well, I think that um, the, the internet um, has killed traditional journalism because, you know, um, most people are online now. So magazines and newspapers are few or far between. So pretty yes. much every magazine and newspaper that I've I've written for has at one point said to me, Marshall, um, we just don't have to cut our freelance budget and we're going to take everything in-house Um we're not going to take you in house, and uh, and then you know you start again, you start again and again. Mm. It's like uh, for years and years, you're just proving yourself to a new set of people and a new set of people, and um, it is hard, bloody work. It is hard, disheartening, poorly paid work where people are saying, "Oh well, you know, could you just do this for a little while and you know prove yourself?" And you know, it's like you know, for God's sake, you know. How am I going to be? Am I going to be proving myself until I die? You know, it, it's like all that kind of. Oh, this is really good for you for exposure, and everybody wants to get something for nothing. And <laughs> yeah. the fact is that there are kids who come out of uh, you know university, and uh, rightly so, they need to build up a stock of, of 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 work for people to see. And so there's always somebody, whether they can write or not, whether they have experience or not, who's willing to do the work for free. Most yeah. um, online sites are more interested in in you just to dig the right SEO keywords than actually writing uh, work of quality. They basically just want you to write something that uh, people, when they do search engine sites, they'll uh, they'll hit the right word. It'll drive them to the site. And whether or not mm. they actually read the whole thing you've written, you, you know, you're going to then just try and sell them stuff. So, you know, it, 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 it's difficult. But rather than, um, you know, bitch and moan about that and feel like my uh, traditional – job have been taken away from me um i tried to um i tried to move with the times you know i got into social media mm -hmm. i kind of embraced i embraced the digital and uh, it took a while but um i find if you just if you stay interested and, and, and you adapt um I, I i like writing long reviews where i can put things in historical perspective where i can talk yeah. about every aspect of the film where i can i could write a thousand words i could write two thousand words about you know films um you know and, and i enjoy the care and the craft that goes into that i like expressing myself mm. um you know fully equally i think that there is um some skill in being able to express yourself very uh shortly and succinctly and um I sometimes will spend like an on the train home from a from a screening I'll spend 45 minutes or an hour crafting what I think of as the perfect tweet which pretty much just sums up everything like I just saw the joke I just saw Joker and I mean I didn't mm. like it at all and um and you know I spent the whole journey back um thinking about you know what i wanted to say about it and kind of messing around with it and it was like you know i quite enjoyed that process and uh, by the end of uh, the journey i had a 280 character tweet that was as that, that absolutely summed up what it was about and uh, how what i felt about it and uh, you know i i think that that's an interesting challenge and i and i do enjoy doing that and and i think that uh, although i was you know trolled by some people um for you know if you don't like something or if you do like something there's always going to be somebody who has a go at you but um i i i i've kind of um if i've been frustrated in my life with work i've i've kind of turned more and more to uh to twitter i've used my journalist training you know like when you was younger it's like there was a real um cachet in being able to craft a, a good snappy headline and um, in a way tweets are kind of like extended headlines you know you come up they they're a bit punny and they have they're kind of snappy and um and yeah. so I, I i kind of felt like uh, that suits me you know if i think of something funny or i see a funny picture or i it, you know twitter for me works because it's a good combination of image and words i instagram is fine but i i'm not interested in a medium where you basically it's 100 percent the picture 
You know, that yeah. works for products and that's amazing. But for people, you know, I've got something to say. And uh, so I turned increasingly to Twitter and I used it as a place to talk about all the things I love, to show pictures uh, of my collection, to connect yeah. with other nerds like myself and, um, you know, to, show, to, to share clips of, you know, classic movie musicals and science fiction movies and horror movies. And then increasingly I started making my own content, my own kind of silly videos and pictures. And, you know, people seem to like it. And, and I found a lot of people, like I would talk a lot about, you know, Ray Harryhausen movies and stuff. And, and, you know, people would say, oh, I've never seen that or oh, that's amazing or what, you know, or they want to know more about it. And I feel like um, that's pretty noble. Um, pursuit for a, for a geek to um, actually you know keep these things alive and to and to you know inform people about it and you know that I don't need to be sound highfalutin. Mostly, I'm just sharing the things I love with other people like yourself who also love them, and we're just yeah. you know nerding out together because that's what we like to do. Um, I also like uh, Twitter because I've made um, you know on Twitter and social media that's how you know we first met and started talking yeah, to exactly. each other and, and yeah. actually I've made lots of people who I consider good friends um, through um, through uh, Twitter and people who you know um, I, it's, Twitter has given me tremendous access to people who um, I would never have been able to uh, to uh, to meet or talk to I mean outside of like uh, 10 minute interviews and things and yeah. So, so the thing is, so now I've, I've got like just over a hundred thousand followers on Twitter. Yeah, yeah and, exactly. Uh, you know, they kind of, but, you know, it's like you, you've, you've got to put in the time for that. It's, uh, you know, it's not like, a, I'm not like paying a company to, you know, boost my numbers. There's no fake followers there. It's, um, you know, it, it's because I, I created this safe place where there's no politics. There's no trolling. There's no Brexit. There's no Trump. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just a place where people can kind of um, escape all of that stuff on, on Twitter and come and just um, have some good, clean, um, mostly clean, nerdy, nerdy fun. And uh, because of that, I've actually started to get followed by you know loads of celebrities. And by celebrities, I, I don't mean the Kardashians of the world. I'm talking about filmmakers, actors, directors, lots yeah. of writers, who's comic the book most, artists. Who's the most surprising person that you've had? Who's the person that's made, made, that made you wink go? Oh, oh, oh dear. Oh dear. Well, I didn't know why, I didn't know why Gordon Ramsay followed me. That was kind of <laughs> mysterious. Courtney Love followed me and I thought that had to be a mistake. And then she unfollowed yeah. me like a year later after having, oh, well. we had like no, I, I didn't know what that was about. Um, you know, but I, I, I think I, I stopped being surprised because I realized that, um, although we like to think of, uh, you know, filmmakers and all the people who we admire as somehow being sort of not human exactly just you know or better or kind of legendary or somehow but you know it, it turns out that actually they're people and that there's a very good percentage of actors and writers and filmmakers who are actually colossal nerds and when it comes to nerds um, we all connect on the same level you know i've met and had fantastic conversations with people like Tim Burton. And, uh, you know, we were talking about Bond films and Harryhausen movies. And, and he wasn't talking to me as like, oh, I'm Tim Burton, the, you know, kind of idiosyncratic auteur um, who's had all this success and blah, blah, blah. He was talking to me. It's just somebody who really grew up watching Bond films and loves them and, 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 and the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms and geeking out over that. And, and it was like, I think if you... You realize that actually, um, that there's a lot of geeks in the world. And then, so now when people some, sometimes follow us, now when somebody famous and cool follows me, I think, okay, another nerd, <laughs> another nerd's joined the game. to the collection. Yeah. And, exactly. it, and it's, uh, but, and it's, uh, you know, I, I love it. And, um, I remember I was watching, uh, a few years ago, uh, girls and Hannah, um, the character Hannah, she went to a shrink played by Bob Balaban. And I was like yeah. Bob Balaban ever since Close Encounters. Um, and, uh, he was, his character was talking about, um, like a guy who goes around with a time traveling dog that he, she was talking about a book that she'd written. And he said, Oh, yes, I've written a book about like a, a time traveling dog or, you know, something, it was some crazy thing. And I, I tweeted, and this was long before I had loads and loads of followers, but I tweeted like, uh, 
and I tagged him in it and I said, gosh, that, I, I, I wish you would write that book. I think that would just be so amazing. I thought that was just so funny. And he replied to me, he said, well, actually, I did write that book. I actually wrote a whole series of books like that. It was wow. just a big in-joke in the show. And here's yeah. a link to them. And um, and that was the first time that, you know, like a, a like a, an actor or a celebrity had kind of directly replied to me. And I really liked it. And I thought, hello, okay, um, I have some more of that, please. And what I especially <laughs> liked about it was um, that uh, today, um, you know, look, PRs and marketing people, they do a difficult job and yeah. uh, it's a crowded marketplace, um, but they do tend to do um, the, their main job seems to be running interference between journalists yeah. and yeah. Um, and and talent and uh, I, I whereas it used to be a symbiotic relationship now i think uh, they they just hold you at arm's length now they're there to instead of facilitating a nice hour-long interview they're saying okay well you can have two minutes on camera with the person and we're going to stand behind them the whole time and we're yeah. going to you know do this motion which means wrap it up and we're going to shake our head if you're not happy with the question and and basically um they they just get in the way and what i like to ask something else I like about about Twitter is like you can reach out to the people who you admire and you can just contact them directly and you know yeah. most of them, many of them most of them probably um, aren't necessarily going to even notice you or reply to you but um, I actually have more success in, 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 in meeting and chatting with people online than I have through any official means and so you know fast forward to when I get this book contract um, hmm. which, you know, uh, I, I, originally it was, I've been pitching around this, this quiz book idea for years. And they're like, Oh, Marshall, you know, quiz books aren't going to work in print. You know, print is dead. Nobody's interested. You know, you've got to be like Harry Potter or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, I don't know. I think that actually, you know, a quiz book, um, written properly, written with love and full of juicy information and, um, fun facts and, and, you know, uh, uh, written for written right um could be you know just just what the doctor ordered really but it was like it took a long time for somebody to come around to that in the end it took me having a hundred thousand followers on twitter to convince the publisher that actually yeah. um i had the juice and the following uh, uh to um to create something like that and so i was happy i was off and um, yeah. I was very pleased that September Publishing uh, took a punt on me, and I really, really appreciate that. So after I got the contract, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun if I actually asked a few other people following me for, for, for questions? And it, was, it wasn't it was like something that I sold um, the book on, but yeah. um, because it, it was, you know, it was a bit speculative saying, you know, I would like to ask the of the 200 most famous followers that I have, if I ask um, everybody, and, and then, you know, hopefully – some of them will get back to me and give me some answers and that'll be a nice thing to add to the book. Well, um, I just thought of it afterwards and I reached out to some people and, uh, they, you know, I DM say, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 people and, and a decent number got back to me, you know, 15, 20. And of those 15 or 20, you know, 10 ended up, um, actually giving me a question and so you know i was off. I, I kind of, uh, reached out to lots of people and I ended up getting 50, Really cool questions uh, and answers um, from uh, all sorts of amazing people. And, and you know, it wasn't uh, – not everybody followed me. Like I got a question from Mark Hamill for Star Wars, and he yes. doesn't follow me. But what I no. did was I just – he's very good on Twitter. And so what I did was I just uh, – I, I put out a request. It kind of helped me, Mark Hamill. You're my only hope. I'm writing a quiz about Star Wars. And uh, and he gave me a fantastic question. And I, I spent – in terms of what the book covers, it covers like 20, 20 different great 20th century fandoms. So um, I do um, – James Bond, but only yeah. the Roger Moore years. I do Doctor Who, but only Tom Baker. I do the original Star Wars trilogy. I do um, the original um, Star Trek series. Um, I do the Atari, you know, 2600. So the first proper Atari console, the first real, you know, co major console 
Um, I do uh, Marvel Silver Age, all 1960s Marvel, all the kind of early Stan Lee, Steve Ditko, uh, Jack mm-hmm. Kirby years. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I cover a lot, I, as far back as the Universal Monsters of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, and I use science fiction movies of the 50s, um, Stephen King, uh, cinema and books of the 70s, uh, action movies of the 80s. I go up to like uh, Simpsons, uh, the first 10 years of The Simpsons. And I also do like Batman, the animated uh the animated series so it covers a lot of ground and so i was able to reach out to lots of people and either they gave me questions for the things that they'd been involved in or they gave me questions about things that they loved so um tony todd you know was the candy man i didn't actually do anything yeah. um, that the candy man wasn't covered in the book but he gave me a really great question about the universal monsters um yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mark miller who you know obviously wrote kingsman I, I wasn't actually covering anything of his in the book but he gave me a fantastic question about james bond about a roger Moore question about james bond um, and at the same time um i have a John Carpenter chapter and, and I was very excited that John Carpenter um, gave me a question for that chapter as well as his wife uh, Sandy King who's his producer on yeah. some of his latest films and Sam Neill gave me a question for In the Mouth of Madness so um, you know Tom Savini gave me a question for Dawn of the Dead which was like, incredibly thrilling um, you know I got questions from uh, just uh, you know, really some, some some wonderful and surprising people. Even uh, like Carrie Hen, who played Newt in Aliens. Oh um, yeah, yeah. She yeah. gave me a question, but she gave me a question about Cinderella for my for my Disney chapter. Uh, Dan Lloyd, who played Danny in The Shining, he gave me a Shining question. And you know, these are some of these questions they've not been asked before. They're asking information that I suppose it's. You know, you're not really going to necessarily get that one right if you're asked it. <laughs> it's not. They're not. Diff, they're not easy questions because I've I've flicked. I've kind of looked through it, and it's a case of because normally on these things it's kind of like, oh, here's your, here's your Bond trivia kind of thing, and you read through the questions, you're just like, yeah, I know that one. Yeah, I know that one. Yeah, I've seen that one. I've seen that one. And the thing that I noticed about your book is you've not steered away from asking the more kind of difficult quiz questions to, that people might actually have to really scratch their head over and think over so in that case it's not the the issue that I normally see with not a lot of these kind of kind of fun quiz books kind of thing is that you go through it in kind of like an hour and you just you kind of go oh, yeah I know this I know this I know this mm-hmm. whereas yours seems to be the thing you would take it to a pub quiz or everybody would sit down after dinner or, you know, somebody who actually was a really big fan of James Bond yeah. would go, I'll go to the James Bond section because I'm bound to know all these questions. What the, what's going on here kind of thing. <laughs> and it's that kind of thing, which I found intriguing because there's an awful lot of work that's gone into kind of vintage geek kind of itself i did try my best to come up with lots of interesting questions and i was not in the least bit concerned with um look there are questions that you know you're going to be able to answer questions from most chapters and if you're a big james bond fan you're going to be able to answer a fair few of the questions but you're not going to be able to answer all of the questions if you're a big mm. tom baker fan um you're going to be able to answer a decent number of the doc two questions mm. but you are not going to be able to answer them all um mm. i don't you know, I, I wanted it to be something that, you know, was not frustrating. Um, but I wanted it to be a proper challenge. I didn't want it to be like a puff piece. I wanted it to be something that really rewarded, uh, a lot, lifetimes of fandom for, you know, and if you really love The Simpsons, then, uh, you're going to do fine. If you really love, uh, you know, Star Wars and who doesn't, then, you know, you're going to do fine, but, uh, you are also going to learn some stuff. And it was important to me to not only just, um, like sometimes in my answers, the actual answer to the question is just the kicking off point. And yeah. after that, I like to kind of go into some more detail. So yeah. the first half of the book is obviously the questions, but mm. the second half, it's not just the answers. We repeat the questions again. So basically, yeah. if you want to, if say you don't know much about the universal monsters, you can actually just read the second half with the Q's and followed with the A's followed by the Q's. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. The cues followed by the age, rather, and uh, and uh, you know you can learn some amazing stuff. Like there was some, um, like uh, in my fifty science fiction chapter, there's a day the Earth stood still question, 
Um, and that is just a kind of a kicking off point for me, actually detailing the history of the phrase Klaatu Barada Nikto, you know, kind yeah. of the, uh, the discussions about what it means, all the different times that that phrase has turned up in, in other science fiction films and horror films. And, um, because I've, I've always been fascinated by all that sort of craziness. And so I, I wanted to, I wanted to put it all in, in one book. That's why I didn't want it to just be about Star Wars. I didn't want it to just be about Doctor Who. Um, yeah, I wanted yeah. to just pack um, because I, I'm a great fan of many things, as I think a lot of people are. And I, I just wanted to, you know, pour all of that kind of love and knowledge. And obviously, I did a lot of research. And, you know, you have to really check a lot of your sources. And having had these books going back years and years, I was able to dig up stuff that um, I think hadn't kind of filtered online still. Um, and uh, you know, I'm very proud of. Uh, how it turned out i mean i don't know maybe that just sounds a bit arrogant but i no. i wanted to create something personal and fun and challenging and and that's yeah. why every chapter i i begin with an introduction um, every chapter um has a little bit about um what this meant to me when i was a kid yeah. or when i was growing up and you know i wanted people who um who was sort of my sort of age, my generation, for it to tap into their memories, for them to go, oh, gosh, yeah, I remember like coming home with issue two of 2000 AD and uh, putting yeah, the bionic yeah, stickers yeah. on my, or the biotronic stickers um, on my arm. Um, uh, or if, if you're younger and you're reading it, I just wanted to kind of set the scene like, you know, this is how it felt when, if you were young, when, uh, Salem's Lot was on the TV and, uh, at the end of the first part, um, you know, Danny Glicks, you know, floated up to the window and knocked on the, on the window and, mm -hmm. you know, that freaked everyone the hell out, you know, <laughs> in a, in a big way. And, and it, because it freaked, it was on real television. It freaked out everyone at the same time. Everybody yeah. went to school and were talking about it. It was yeah. you know, that shared experience. We mainly didn't watch it together, but we certainly talked about it at school the next day. And uh, and I just wanted to kind of capture that, that, that just the, the feeling of how it felt to experience all those wonderful things um, when they first happened. And so, you know, it's, I suppose it's kind of, very personal somebody said it's it's like the first auto semi-autobiographical quiz book ever written and uh, it's it's kind of like um you've written it for you going to the family get together at christmas kind of thing where people who are hearing it would kind of go oh yeah you know it's kind of like it's not just a kind of a very cold here's your questions and here's your answers kind of thing there is an awful lot of you in that book, even though it is a kind of a quiz, a quiz book, has it meant that are you thinking about the follow up? Oh yes, I'm yeah? absolutely going to do Vintage Geek Strikes Back. This one has to be successful. You know, there yeah. have to be enough people who actually buy it and want it and, and yeah. love it and request another one. But I've already uh, made a list of the next twenty chapters that I would right. want to do, and um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd be very happy to do another one. It does take some serious obsession you know i spent a long time thinking about it when i got the contract i probably faffed about for the first few months and i contacted a lot of you know people who ended up being my amazing contributors and they've just been so incredibly generous and nice and a lot of them are helping me kind of promote it which is just you know absolutely wonderful Excellent. and you know i made some friends along the way and um, i just feel really i mean it's just it's incredibly cheesy kind of but i just feel kind of really blessed by this because you know all my life i kind of just wanted to create something um a bit special and um and i feel like i've, I've finally cracked that i've finally done that I've, I've finally created something that actually belongs in my collection yeah. and, you know i'm very happy to have done that the cover art itself is just beautiful it, it's, it's cool. just candy it's colors cool. and um and the, with question mark art by the great steve casino who uh, actually yeah. designed the toys that i was hawking around um <laughs> comic con so there's there's all very circular you know it's there like and it all comes from twitter really yeah. twitter's been tremendously good to me i gotta say yeah. and I, I really the book is it's um i'm assuming by the time um Anybody listens to this, the book what will be the out. Day, what date? What's the launch date? Is it going to be? It's out October the 10th. Um, October the 10th. 
Yeah, and I think in America, it's it will be coming out um, a, a few weeks later. There's some issues with Amazon kind of keep changing their dates, but um, hmm. I think it'll just be out towards the end of October um, in the States, and you can pre-order it now. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's at physically in bookshops. Actually, somebody sent me a, a picture from Forbidden Planet where they've already stuck it up on their shelves. Oh, so um, I think if you get down to Forbidden Planet in, in town in London, then uh, you can get it right now. Right cool. this minute. How much is it going to be, Marshall? Oh, I don't know, like 50 pence or something. I sh- <laughs> you know, I, sh- I should actually have a look. I don't even know. How much is it? It says twelve ninety nine in in the UK and sixteen ninety five um in America. There you, there you go. I actually didn't know how much my book was. I am no. detail oriented, but like I said, those aren't real life details. So that's why I have to. I could tell you everything about, you know, uh, Riku Browning, the guy who did all the swimming in the in the creature from the Black Lagoon suit. But I can't tell you how much my book costs. There you go. That's that's a, that's a that's a brilliant place to leave it there. Um, <laughs> if people have been listening along um, and they want to see where you exist on the internet webs. Where can we find you on the internet webs, Mr. Julius? I think that the, the best place to come is to um, just at Marshall Julius. Um, and that's where I am every day. All of my craziness, all of my, everything I write, everything I make, everything I do, pretty much every thought I have um, goes through my Twitter feed. You know, people say, what is your, do you have a website? It's like, yeah, it's my Twitter feed. You know, that is basically <laughs> where I exist online. So just go to, you know, at Marshall Julius on, on Twitter and, and, and I'll be there. And I'm, I'm, awesome. I always respond to anybody tweets at me, asks me a question, anybody DMs me. I, I, I you know, I, I pay attention to everything. I never leave anybody hanging. You know, you can't, somebody who tries to high five you digitally, you can't just leave them hanging, can you? So it's like, exactly. uh, because I tell you what, I know what it's like to, um, to reach out to somebody, um, speculatively on, on Twitter. I know how it feels to not be responded to. And I know how wonderful it feels to be responded to. Yeah. And, uh, so I would never leave anybody hanging. So, you know, if you, if you like the book, if you don't like the book, but if, especially if you like the book, you know, come and talk to me, ask me questions, play along. Um, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I'll always, I'm always there. I'm always on Twitter. Awesome. 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 Um, and if you want to keep an eye on what we're up to, you can find us on Twitter as well at We're Not Wizards and Instagram at We're Not Wizards and our website, We're Not Wizards dot com and Facebook at We're Not Wizards. And you can find us on all the podcast catchers that either use the word pod or the word cast or use neither, like Player FM. Um, if you like what you've listened to tonight, then check out Marshall's book, which will be available at the time you're listening to this, and we'll put links in the show notes. Um, you can also tell somebody else about us as well, because that's how we spread like a virus, basically. Um, or you can go to the Apple Podcasts and you can drop us a rating, a review, and a subscription. If you are going to be giving us a rating or review, don't give us 10 stars, because it makes us big-headed. But don't give us one star because it makes us cry. Give us something in the middle, like a five, because it's average. Oh, no, give him a nine. Give him a nine, for God's sake. It's eight or a nine. It's like eight? five. No. Who, who asks for a five? He's serious. I think nine, eights and nines, you know, at least. Everybody, give this an eight and a nine and a few tens, because you deserve a few tens, mate. I've seen your stuff. I've listened to your stuff. <laughs> and you deserve a few tens. Don't aim for fives. Nobody aims for fives. But the person I was going to say, but the person who's not been average tonight, and iTunes Apple Podcast is at maximum at five. Just saying. Um, but the person who's not been average tonight is rather wonderful, rather fantastic, Mr. Marshall Julius. Thank you very much, sir, for oh, coming. Oh, you are on. so welcome. You are welcome. I really, really love talking about myself, and so thank you for giving me the opportunity to do you know <laughs> one of my one of my favourite things. I, I really appreciate it. Excellent. There's only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we're many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Marshall? We're not wizards. Or are we wizards? No, we're Uh, not wizards. We're not wizards. I can stop it. And the second thing is to say goodbye. So it's a goodbye from Marshall. Say goodbye, Marshall. Goodbye, Marshall. And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. Make something awful. And if you're in the mood for a bit 
of quizzing and questions and background and laughter. Check out Vintage Geek. Until the next time, goodbye. A wizard is never linked. Is he early? He arrives precisely when he means to.